did in Jerusalem, and many of the saints did I shut up in prison, having received authority from the chief priests. And when they were put to death, I gave my voice against them. And I punished them oft in every synagogue, and compelled them to blaspheme. And being exceedingly mad against them, I persecuted them even unto strange cities. Whereupon, as I went to Damascus with authority and commission from the chief priests, at midday, O king, I saw in the way a light from heaven, above the brightness of the sun, shining round about me and them which journeyed with me. And when we were all fallen to the earth, I heard a voice speaking unto me and saying in the Hebrew tongue, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. And I said, Who art thou, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus whom thou persecutest. But arise and stand upon thy feet, for I have appeared unto thee for this purpose, to make thee a minister and a witness, both of these things which thou hast seen and of those things in the which I will appear unto thee, delivering thee from the people and from the Gentiles unto whom now I send thee, to open their eyes and to turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan unto God that they may receive forgiveness of sins and inheritance among them which are sanctified by faith that is in me. Whereupon, O King Agrippa, I was not disobedient unto the heavenly vision, but showed first unto them of Damascus and at Jerusalem and throughout all the coasts of Judea, and then to the Gentiles that they should repent and turn to God and do works meet for repentance. For these causes the Jews caught me in the temple and went about to kill me. Having therefore obtained help of God, I continue unto this day, witnessing both the small and great, saying none other things than those which the prophets and Moses did say should come, that Christ should suffer and that he should be the first that should rise from the dead and should show light unto the people and to the Gentiles. And as he thus spake for himself, Festus said with a loud voice, Paul, thou art beside thyself, much learning doth make thee mad. But he said, I am not mad, most noble Festus, but speak forth the words of truth and soberness. For the king knoweth of these things, before whom also I speak freely. For I am persuaded that none of these things are hidden from him, for this thing was not done in a corner. King Agrippa, believest thou the prophets? I know that thou believest. Then Agrippa said unto Paul, Almost thou persuadest me to be a Christian. And Paul said, I would to God that not only thou, but also all that hear me this day were both almost and altogether such as I am, except these bonds. And when he had thus spoken, the king rose up, and the governor and Bernice, and they that sat with them. And when they were gone aside, they talked between themselves, saying, This man doeth nothing worthy of death or of bonds. Then said Agrippa unto Festus, This man might have been set at liberty if he had not appealed unto Caesar. Let's pray. Dear Lord, we thank you so much for your scripture. God, I pray that you please fill me with your spirit and with your power this morning. God, help me to expound this message. Help us all to learn this morning and to, and to walk away edified as well as um, just more knowledgeable, dear God, in your doctrine and in this truth. And Lord, I pray that you please just soften up our hearts. Help us to be receptive to hear what you'd have us to learn. And um, help us all just to, to stay focused and intent on your words. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right, now in Acts chapter number 26, the part of the, the passage I want to focus on here starts in verse number 14, where we see Paul, well, Saul at this time is on, his, on the way to Damascus. And he's out, he's persecuting the church, and he's trying to... Um, you know, or getting people arrested, and he's doing all these things, which we already read in the chapter. He's explaining how he persecuted the church, and, and he's trying to get people arrested and everything else. And Jesus Christ appears unto him in this heavenly vision, and, you know, light shines round about him. It's this big thing. But I want to focus on what Jesus says to him, because I'm not going to, the, the sermon's not about this story, but Jesus says something real interesting. And we're going to start reading again back in verse 14. It says in when we were all fallen to the earth, I heard a voice speaking unto me and saying in the Hebrew tongue, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. And I said, Who art thou, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus whom thou persecutest. So see, this is Jesus speaking to Paul. 
Verse 16, But arise and stand upon thy feet, for I have appeared unto thee for this purpose, to make thee a minister and a witness, both of these things which thou hast seen, and of those things in the which I will appear unto thee, delivering thee from the people and from the Gentiles unto whom I now send thee, to open their eyes. What, pay attention. This is, this is where I'm getting a text verse from. Verse 18. This is, this is Saul's commandment from Christ of what he wants them to do. He says to open their eyes, talking about the Gentiles, and to turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan unto God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and inheritance among them which are sanctified by faith that is in me. And what we're preaching about this morning is the power of Satan versus the power of God. And we see here Jesus Christ's commandment unto Paul was, hey, you're going to be sent to the Gentiles. They need to be delivered from the power of Satan. And they need to be brought under the power of God. And obviously that comes with salvation first and foremost. But we're going we're gonna to delve in a little bit first into what the power of Satan is. And then we're going to go into what the power of God is. And um, turn, if you would, please, to Matthew chapter number 4. You're in Acts. Just flip back a little bit to Matthew chapter number 4. We're going to look at some specific attributes of Satan. It's important to understand how Satan operates because he operates the same way as he has all the way, you know, 2,000 years ago, 4,000 years ago, and 6,000 years ago. He uses the same tactics. The only problem is he probably just gets better and better at him over time. He just gets more and more subtle. He gets more and more convincing um, in his ways after this amount of time of deceiving human beings and being on this earth. And he knows what our weaknesses are. He knows where to, to attack us from. So we need to be aware of this and aware of his tactics and aware of the power because Satan has power today. Nope. We need to, uh, Satan's real. I mean, people might laugh at you or scoff you like, oh yeah, you believe in, in fairy tales and Satan and that there's these angels and stuff. Yes, I do. Amen. The Bible talks about him quite often and we're going to see specifically this morning about Satan and the power that he has. Look at Matthew chapter 4. This is when Jesus Christ was being tempted in the wilderness. Right after Jesus got baptized, he went out in the wilderness and, and he was out there for 40 days and 40 nights and he was tempted of Satan. And look at verse number three. It says that when the tempter came to him, he said, if thou be the son of God, command that these stones be made bread. So now he's just going and tempting him. Um, well, look at, look at Jesus' answer, verse four. It says, but he answered and said, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. So here, it, you know, the reason why he's saying to command these stones to be made bread is because he's fasting, right? He's fasting unto the Lord. He's out in the wilderness. He has this alone time. He's praying unto God. He's, he's about to embark on this great work. And he sets aside 40 days to go out to fast in the wilderness, to get, you know, to pray and to just be prepared and ready to go out and do this great work. And the devil's tempting him. He knows he's hungry. I mean, you start fasting. For anyone who's ever fasted before, you know, even fasting for one day, you start to, you start to feel the effects of the fast. And I remember there's been times where I've fasted and I used to own a motorcycle. I'd be driving home from work. I, you know, I fast all day, I fast at work and I'd be driving home and man, you know, it's right around dinner time and people are barbecuing outside and you could smell that. Like normally you wouldn't even think anything of it. When you're satisfied, when you're, you know, when you're not that hungry because, you know, you've eaten, you've already eaten a couple meals in the day. Yeah, you're hungry, you'll eat some dinner. I mean, we live in a country now, especially in, in, in so much wealth and abundance that a lot of people don't even understand what it means to be hungry at all. And, and praise God and thank the Lord for the abundance that we have. But it's so easy to forget about how good we have it when it's been so nice for so long. And, um, but with the fasting, the, the aromas, the, you know, your, your stomach's growling and, and your body's trying to tell you it's hungry and um, you become much more sensitive and aware to these things which is all the more reason you need to be strong and strong in your spirit and strong in your will to be able to say, no, I'm fasting unto the Lord and this is more important than my fleshly appetite, right? Now, 
This can be applied in many ways with Satan's attack here. He's, he's appealing to Jesus Christ at his physical appetite because he's fasting. This is a moment where Jesus is going to be weaker or any man for that matter. Anybody. When you're, you know, when you're fasting, you're going to be a lot more tempted to eat something. You're going to want to eat something because you're hungry because you've gone without food for so long. It's a weak, it's, it's a weak point and he's, and he's trying and this is the first thing he attacks. He singles out what's his weakness right now. What is blaring? What is obvious to me that his weakness is right now? And he goes and attacks it. And maybe you don't fast that much. It might not be food as it was in Jesus' case. It could be anything. Whatever your particular weakness is, whatever, whatever your fleshly desires are, whatever it is that, that, that you might be wanting to do, especially things that are sinful, that your flesh wants you to do. Some people who, who have had problems with alcohol in the past you know, or, or even currently or whatever, you know, Satan's going to be able to tempt them with that indulgence, with that, with, with that um, sin of their flesh because normally when, you know, when people get sucked into a lot of these sins, even after you come out of it, there's still a part of your fleshly appetite, that this fleshly sinful body that wants to go back and do those things again. And Satan's going to find those weak points. And you know, we have to be aware of this so that we can stand strong and, and be able to resist the wiles of the devil. And when, and when, they start to, when it starts to, we start to be confronted with the temptations to sin, understand, hey, this is coming from Satan. This is coming from the devil. This is not coming from God. This is not something I should be getting into and be aware of this. But um, let's look at some of the other th um, temptations that the devil made with Jesus Christ here in the desert. Verse number 5 says, Then the devil taketh him up into the holy city and setteth him on a, pink, a pinnacle of the temple and saith unto him, If thou be the Son of God, cast thyself down, for it is written, He shall give his angels charge concerning thee, and in their hands they shall bear thee up, lest at any time thou dash thy foot against the a stone. Jesus said unto him, it is written again, thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. So here he's trying to say, look, well, if you're the son of God, hey, the Bible says that you're not going to get hurt. You know, the angels will be there so you don't get hurt. He's like, so why don't you just cast yourself down off of this, you know, off the top of this temple right now and prove it. Why don't you just, you know, just jump off and just, just be reckless and just prove that God's going to protect you anyways. And we see what Satan's doing here as well. In the first uh, temptation as well as in this one, he's goading Jesus. He's trying to be like, oh, well, if you really are this, oh, if you really are this, you know, why don't you just prove it to me? And this is a haughty attitude. This is a proud, puffed up attitude. And what people will try to do is they'll try to suck you into this. It's this, oh, what are you, chicken? It's the same mentality. It's the same mindset. And what it, all that is is a snare. It's a trap. Don't let yourself get suckered into that especially the men. Because this is something that, that when men are, feel challenged or provoked, that it's a lot easier to come right back and get involved in that fight. And a lot of times these fights aren't even worth it yep. at all. It's a waste of your time. Now, I'm not saying to never fight. Obviously, we need to contend for the faith. And there's, you know, we, we stand fast on God's Word. And there are times when we need to bring the truth of the Gospel or just bring the truth of God's Word in this, in this you know, let it shine in this dark world and, and not be afraid and not be afraid of the fight. But at the same time, we don't, we don't need to be getting involved in these foolish arguments and foolish debates and these big wastes of time and people say, oh, well, prove this and prove this. Look, you're either going to believe something or you're not. You don't need to prove it. And that's what the devil's trying to do. Oh, well, prove it. Prove that you're a son of God. He'll prove all this stuff. And that's what the atheists will try. Well, well prove that God's real. Well, I'm not going to prove that God's real. You, 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 there's no way you can prove to, to the level that these people want proof. I mean, think about this. Think about, because it's the same mindset that the devil has that the Pharisees had against Jesus Christ. Because they were saying, um, they, they would go to Jesus Christ and be like, oh, well, what sign do you show us? Also, he's going around town and healing people. They, and and it's, it's obvious. I mean, there's, there's people, there's a guy that was born blind from his birth. Jesus healed him. There are people who were lame on their feet. Jesus healed them. I mean, there's, there's all manner of diseases all manner of devils being, being you know, cast out of people. I mean, he was literally turning the world upside down. Everybody was talking about this, and everybody knew it was happening, and they even admitted it themselves. 
that this man does so, so many miracles. You know, we can't deny this. When he raised Lazarus from the dead, they're just like, we can't do anything about this. They knew he was doing all these miracles, but it still wasn't enough for them to believe. No amount of evidence was enough for them to believe. But they'll still try to get you into this trap. Oh, I'll well, prove it. You know, look, you have to take it on faith, just like your salvation. In order to be saved, you take it by faith. Faith is something you don't see. It's something you have to put your trust in. But this is the way the devil is going to try to attack you. And when you get sucked into this, when you get sucked into this line of attack of just, oh, well, prove this, prove that, with everything, it can cause you to, to maybe start to, to doubt your own faith in some way. It depends. I mean, it depends on the situation, but like, there's a lot of naysayers out there. Now, it's funny because I'm preaching a sermon tonight about the scriptures, just about God's holy word and his scripture. And I was studying up for this. And there's a lot of people out there that'll try to say, oh, there's all these different there's contradictions in the Bible. And um, they'll bring up these seeming contradictions. And they can be confusing. And I'll admit that. They could be, oh, man, I don't know what this means. And just on first glance, you could look at it and be like, oh, yeah, that doesn't make any sense. That's... And, and start to, to shatter your... You know, it could... It, with some people, especially with weaker Christians... It can, it can really damage their faith and, and say, well, I don't, I don't know anymore. And just, and just, I don't even know if any of this stuff is real. I, you know, I believed it, but now I don't know because how could this be God's word? And there's all these problems here and stuff. And when you, when you get caught up in, in Satan's line of thinking and Satan's attacks, instead of just rejecting him, and you look, every time Jesus rejected Satan, he did do it with the Bible. So, I mean, we should know the Bible for ourselves anyways to be able to answer the attacks of the devil with Scripture. Jesus knew the Scripture to be able to say, well, no, this is why I'm not doing that. This is why I'm not doing that. This is why I'm not doing that. Because God said, because it is written, because the Bible says, you know, man shall not live by bread alone. Because the Bible says, thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. That's why I'm not going to go out and just do these stupid things and, and just cast myself off of this temple because... God's word says not to tempt the Lord thy God, and I'm not going to do it. Amen. And then let's look at the, the third, the third um, attack that Satan makes on Jesus. It says in verse 8, Again, the devil taketh him up into an exceeding high mountain and showeth him all the kingdoms of the world and the glory of them, and saith unto him, All these things will I give thee if thou wilt fall down and worship me. Now, we're talking, again, I want to kind of get back to focusing on the power of Satan. The power that he has. He had the power to bring Jesus up into this temple. He had the power to bring him up into this high mountain and to show him all the kingdoms of the world. And because he is the God of this world, Satan is, is at this time, he's the one that's, that's basically in charge of the, you know, of, the, of the darkness and the spiritual wickedness in high places in this world. And is, and is behind a lot of the, or all of the, the problems in this world. But he is like, he is the God of this world. The lowercase g God of this world. And that's why, the, you know, the world just continues to get worse and worse and worse. And um, it's not that God has no power. It's not that, that God doesn't ever step in. But Satan is the one really that's, that's in charge right now. But his time is going to come. And we know that that's going to happen. But... He has, a, he has a lot of power. We, we cannot neglect this. And he had the power. I, be, I believe he did have the power to give all the kingdoms to Jesus because he was running them. He said, well, I'll give all this to you. I've been running all these kingdoms. You can have it all. Just fall down and worship me. That's, he wants to be like the Most High. He wants to be like God. He wants to be worshipped. And, um, of course, Jesus answers him in verse 10. Then Jesus saith, unto him, get thee hence, Satan, for it is written, thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. And what I like to point out as well with this is that then, then Satan leaves. Jesus, now, he comes at him with his weak point, with, with he's hungry. Right? He attacks him that way. Then he attacks him with just tempting God. And, and, and trying to prove, oh, well, prove yourself, God, by throwing yourself off this. And then he tries to entice him with power, with money, with this position. All of these different things, he's, he's trying to hit him. He's trying to find a weakness. He's trying to say, oh, well, see, Jesus knows that he is king of kings and he is Lord of lords. 
But he's not at that point right now. He's not. He came to do something else. And, and at this point, he's just getting started his ministry. He's not the king. He has to go through all these other things before, before he, he be, you know, becomes crowned king of kings, and especially before his millennial reign is set up here. And he's trying to, to the Satan's trying to get him to you know, want that right now. Just get it right away and just, just get it immediately. And this is a mindset that's pervasive in our society. People have this mentality of not wanting to wait for things and just, I, I need it right now. I, want, I need to fast food. I need to fast this. I need fast. I, uh, I need everything done and just, just me, me, me right now, 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 now. And no one's willing to wait for anything or put time into anything. You know, whether it be raising children takes a lot of time and effort and energy into making sure they come up right instead of just saying, here, here's a little device here. Just, just take this and go play and, and, and you know, I'll, I'll see you again in eight hours. Or sending them off to, to let someone else raise them, whatever. I mean, there's... If you want something done right, it's going to take time, it's going to take energy, it's going to take effort. And in order for children to grow up right, they need time, they need energy, they need effort directed at them. And just like any, I mean, if you want to eat a healthy meal, you want to eat a good meal, well, you're not going to get that from Burger King. You're not going to get that from Burger King. Now, you're going to get it right away, right? I mean, you'll get it real fast. You could just go right through that drive through and it'll be ready in, in two minutes. But that's not going to be good for you. You'll get it quick, but you're sacrificing nutrition, you're sacrificing your health, you're sacrificing a lot of things by, by going to these places and, and you know, trying to get things the fast way. But these are all these different attacks that Satan does. Now turn, if you would, to Job chapter 1. We're going to see some other ways that of power of Satan that he's able to uh, use against us. This is his temptations. Now what's great about the power of Satan versus the power of God is that we know the power of God is always greater. And I'll just read from you for you from 1 Corinthians 10. Because this is we just we just looked at everything we just read in Matthew 4 was Satan's power of temptation, enticing us to sin, his his ability to, to tempt us into doing things that we ought not to do. But the Bible tells us in 1 Corinthians 10, verse number 13, it says, There hath no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above that ye are able, but will with the temptation also make a way to escape, that ye may be able to bear it. Satan's power is, is pretty large, but it's limited. Satan does have a lot of power, but it's definitely limited. And God says that no matter how much Satan might be tempting you, there's always a way out. God, will, God promises. He makes sure there's always a way out. Now, it might not be easy. No one ever said it's going to be easy. Withstanding temptation isn't easy, but it's not impossible. It's never impossible. Never once. The power of God, when it comes to this temptation is much greater than the power of Satan. But we can't ignore that power that Satan has because it's, it will be difficult. But you're in Job chapter 1. We're going to see another power that Satan has. This is something that Satan is capable of doing when he attacks Job. Look at verse number 12 of Job chapter 1. The Bible says, And the Lord said unto Satan, Behold, all that he hath is in thy power. Satan has this power. God's granting him this power. Only upon himself put not forth thine hand. So Satan went forth from the presence of the Lord. And, and this is what Satan does when he attacks Job. Because Satan does attack people too. Not just with temptations. Not just with trying to get them to sin against God. He, he literally just goes out and will attack you. There's different methods of attack. His ultimate goal is to just get you away from God. His ultimate goal is that if you're not saved, he doesn't want you to get saved. And if you are saved, he wants you not serving God, not in good fellowship with God, not in good standing, out of church, and doing everything that's wicked so that you can't go and get anyone else saved. This is what Satan is trying to do. So he tries different tactics. One way might just be to, to come up to you and be buddy-buddy and say, Hey, look at I'll give you all this power. Hey... Why don't you just, why don't you just make, make this food? I know you're fasting, but come on, you're hungry. Just give in. 
That's one way he approaches you. The, the, the quote-unquote nice way. But look what he does to Job. Verse number 13. And there was a day when his sons and daughters were eating and drinking wine in their elder brother's house, eldest brother's house. And there came a messenger unto Job and said, The oxen were plowing and the asses feeding beside them. And the Sabaeans fell upon them and took them away. Yea, they have slain the servants with the edge of the sword, and I only am escaped alone to tell thee. While he was yet speaking, there came also another and said, The fire of God is fallen from heaven and hath burned up the sheep and the servants and consumed them, and I only am escaped alone to tell thee. While he was yet speaking, there came also another and said, The Chaldeans made out three bands and fell upon the camels and have carried them away, yea, and slain the servants with the edge of the sword. And I only am escaped alone to tell thee. Now, we see here, he loses his oxen. He loses his sheep. He loses his camels. And all of his servants that were, that were watching over and taking care of those, I mean, the people as well, not just the animals, not just that physical wealth of, of all the, you know, sheep, oxen, camels, you know, all this wealth that he had, but the people too. All of his servants, all of his employees are wiped out. But then, it, you know, as if that's not enough. And, and see how Satan plans this out. One, one guy comes to report and he leaves one guy alive to just come and tell him everything else is wiped out and he's able with, with his precision his calculation to be able to, to make it so that these people go and it's just one after the other after the other after the other because while he was yet I mean these guys are just coming up and it's just like What's going to happen next? I mean, the first thing is bad enough news, right? And now you got this other guy saying, well, now, you know, now, now your oxen are all gone. Now, now all, all your camels are gone. Okay, yeah, now all the sheep are gone. Yeah, and everybody's dead. And then it, it, he finishes it up with this. In verse 18, while he was yet speaking, there came also another and said, thy sons and thy daughters were eating and drinking wine in their eldest brother's house. And behold, there came a great wind from the wilderness and smote the four corners of the house and it fell upon the young men and they are dead. And I only am escaped alone to tell thee. He loses all his wealth, all his cattle, his employees, and now all of his children. Every single child that he had is gone. And I can't imagine that. I can't imagine being at work and someone coming to me and telling me, it would be like, Hey, Brother Dave, your, your, your house burned down. Hey, Brother Dave, you're fired, right? If it start off, hey, you're fired, right? And then as I'm going home, someone comes, hey, your house burned down. And then someone comes and tells me, oh, and by the way, all your family's dead or all your children are dead. I mean, I couldn't, ima I couldn't imagine. That's trying to put myself in his shoes, right? I mean... It's, it's incredible. And look at the way that he works. I mean, he, he's ruthless when he attacks, is he not? I mean, he does not hold back for a second on anything and all just to get him to curse God. That's it. That's Satan's idea. That, that's his goal. is just to get your heart against God. And the ways that he's able to do this, they came, he says, the fire from God came out of heaven. Now, was that from God? No, but did it look like it? That's what they thought? Satan has this power to make people think that something is coming from God. I mean, and with the amount of tragedy that could happen, you might be thinking, how can this not be God? Who has this power to have all of these things happen in, 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 in this type of event, you know, this series of events and fire coming down from heaven and the, the, you know, this whirlwind coming and, and making the roof collapse on my family. How is that not God? God, why are you doing this to me? And when people come with, with this type of, of problems in their life, they usually accuse God, say, God, why? And it's not God. 
It was never God. That was Satan attacking. But he does these things to get us focused on the wrong things and to get us mad at God, mad at the wrong person. We need to be mad at Satan when these things happen. This is where it's coming from. This is where his attacks are coming from. And he has the power to do this. He has the power of doing signs and lying wonders. Second, you don't have to turn it. Turn if you would to 2 Corinthians chapter 11. I just want you to see one more thing about Satan. He has the power to do signs and lying wonders. We see from Job, he's able to bring this fire down from heaven. He's able to cause this whirlwind to crash on Job's children. And he timed it all out perfectly so that Job was just hit one after the other without any time to even let anything sink in. To just beat him down as low as possible. We see from 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, it says in verse 8, And then shall the, that wicked be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming, even him whose coming is after the working of Satan, with all power and signs and lying wonders, and with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish, because they receive not the love of the truth, that they might be saved." And this is talking, of course, about the end times with the Antichrist and all of these miracles and what lying wonders that by the power of Satan are going to be able to be done to deceive the whole world, to deceive people into thinking that the Antichrist is Jesus Christ, that the Antichrist is the second coming of Jesus Christ. He's able to do these things that, that require a level of power to, to, to fool people. And we need to make sure that we're, again, we're founded in God's word so that we're not deceived by the deceiver, that we're not tempted by the tempter, that we could remain strong in God and not charge him foolishly. 2 Corinthians chapter 11, one other way that, that Satan will, will try to deceive you and come to you is as a minister of light. Because the devil, don't forget, he's a con man. He wants to gain your confidence and your trust before he destroys you. Because most people are going to have some type of a guard up, especially Christians. We ought to. Especially Christians that are going to a good church and that are hearing a lot of, of teaching and they're reading their Bibles. Hey, your guard's going to be up, right? He knows he can't just necessarily do the frontal test. He might try it. He did it with Job. Job was a righteous man. He was a godly man. He feared God. But see, that attack didn't, didn't work on Job. Because the Bible says, in all this, Job sinned not, neither charged God foolishly with his lips. Even when his wife said to curse God and die, Job re retained his integrity. He did it. But in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 13, the Bible says, For such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ, and no marvel, for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. Therefore, it is no great thing if his ministers also be transformed as the ministers of righteousness, whose end shall be according to their works. So he's relating here the, the, these false apostles, these false prophets, these false teachers that are claiming the name of Christ. They're saying, hey, we're apostles of Christ. We follow Jesus. There's a lot of this going on today. False teachers, they don't care about the people. They're wolves in sheep's clothing. They're out to just make money. They're out to make merchandise of you. They don't care about the truth. They don't care about you. They don't care about anything. They care about themselves. And, it's, and they claim the name of Christ to do it. False teachers. But this is how Satan works. It says Satan is transformed into an angel of light. So, you know, we have this picture of Satan with the, with the horns and the, and the tail and the pitchfork and he's all red and he's in hell, you know, like, that's not Satan. Nope. That's not. That's just a cartoon. That's not reality. Satan is transformed to an angel of light. I mean, when you think of angels and you think of light and angels, you're going to think heavenly, hey, this is good. This is from God. This is, this is one of God's great 
creatures that serve him, that love him, that are protecting us and everything else that, you, that normally is associated with angels. That's how Satan looks. Is that how he is? No. That's how he looks, though. And he'll come to you and, and make everything look great. He'll talk about God. He'll talk about Jesus. And he tries to gain your confidence to destroy you in the end. Because once he gets his foot in the door, once you're able to let your guard down a little bit, that's when the blow comes. That's when the attack comes. And you won't even necessarily realize it's coming from him. Be able to learn your weaknesses, learn your soft spots, and, and, and then get in your ear and get in your mind to, to <coughs> deceive you. And just, we need, to be, we need to be aware of this. Now, we've seen various powers and tactics that Satan uses, but his objective or goal, it's, it's to control you. And it's to control and to keep you from, one, from getting saved, as I mentioned earlier, and from, two, from serving God. Now, the good news is we have the choice whether we're going to be under the, the power of God or the power of Satan. We don't have to fall under the power of Satan every single time. The Bible tells us, resist the devil and he will flee from you. We saw that evidenced with Jesus Christ. He resisted three temptations from the devil. The devil ran away. If you're strong, if you're if you're a strong adversary, if you're if you're strong in the faith, and if you're not gonna give up an inch to the devil, he's not just gonna waste his time forever. I mean, think about it. there's a lot of people in this world, and you're not necessarily that important to him to spend all of his time breaking you down. Now, he will attack you, he will come after you, but if you can stay strong, he'll he'll go fight another battle somewhere else. He'll go after someone else because not everyone is that strong. And he'll, and he'll be ruining people. But we need to make sure individually that, that we are that strong. That we can resist the devil. And we know, the, because the Bible says so, we know he'll flee. He, he'll run away. He'll flee from us. Even with all of this power that he has, he'll run away. He'll flee from us. But don't be ignorant and don't get puffed up thinking that... We could just handle anything and, and I'm not worried about that Satan one little bit. Because he does, he does have power. We need to just remain humble, trust in God's word. We could, still, we could have confidence, but don't get lifted up in pride. We could be confident in God's word. We could be confident in the promises of God and we could be confident in, in what we're doing for God. But don't let yourself, um, you know, the Bible says, let him that thinketh he standeth take heed lest he fall. Because there are, you know, it's, that's, that's the way that you're going to fall is when you just think everything is going great and fine and you kind of relax a little bit and put your guard down. So the power of God, I mentioned is I'm going to briefly just bring up salvation because um, that is where the true power of God is. It's in our salvation in 2 Corinthians chapter 4. Look at... Um, Turn, if you would, to Ephesians chapter 6. 2 Corinthians 4, verse 3 says, But if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost, in whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe. Now, remember I said Satan was the God of this world? That's where I get that from, 2 Corinthians 4, 4. In whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ who is the image of God, should shine unto them. For we preach not ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord, and ourselves your servants for Jesus' sake. For God, who commanded the light to shine out of darkness, hath shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. But we have this treasure in earthen vessels, that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. You're saying... You know, the power of salvation, this, this glorious, the gospel, this, this great light that we're sent to preach, this power of salvation doesn't come from us. I mean, we're in earthen vessels. We're, we're, we're in fleshly bodies. It comes from God. That's where the true power comes from. But that's the power that it takes to overcome the darkness, to overcome the God of this world, comes from the power of God. 
But you're in Ephesians chapter 6, verse number 10. I was just mentioning how it's important that we keep our guard up, that we're, that we're remaining vigilant because the devil, you know, as a roaring lion, wandereth about seeking whom he may devour. He's looking to devour people. Ephesians 6, verse number 10 says, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, which means because of that, because we're wrestling against principalities, against powers, against spiritual wickedness in high places. This is our fight. This is our battle. Because we are involved in this battle, he says, take unto you the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand. We need the whole armor of God. And I'm not going to get it. That's if you want to keep reading here later, re read the rest of Ephesians chapter six that goes into the whole armor of God and what the different pieces are. I preach an entire sermon about that because that's obviously also important if we're going to be able to stand up against the devil and resist him we need to be protected we need the armor of god to keep us from his power now i'm going to turn to one more place second samuel chapter number 22 I think I'm going to spend the rest of my time here in 2 Samuel 22. We're going to go through most of this chapter. Um, it's a great chapter because remember I mentioned before the power of Satan. Power, Satan has specific powers, but God's power is always greater. So when it, when it came to the power of temptation, hey, we already saw from the Bible that God's not going to tempt us above that we're able. We're, not, we're always going to have a way out. No matter how much Satan tempts you, there's always a way out. You can always get out of it. And that's a fact that's given to us from the Bible. Satan might try to attack you personally as he did to Job. Now, God allowed that to happen to Job, did he not? He, he did allow it to happen. And when these things happen, it's not from God. God's not the cause of this, obviously. God said, hey, I mean, my servant's righteous. He's upright. He's the one that, God's the one that blessed him. God's the one that built a hedge about him. God's the one that was protecting him and giving him all this stuff. Satan's the one that was attacking him. God allowed it to happen, but it still wasn't without purpose or without reason. Job was tried, and he came through like gold, and God blessed him double in the very end. And see, God was very good. And, um, but what we get to see here is that even if the devil tries to attack us, if God, we, get, we take solace, if God allows it to happen, then we can know that, hey, if we're in God's will and God's allowing this to happen, then I will be okay. I will make, through the, make it through this. If Job was able to make it through it with, with, you know, with, with the amount of attacks that were against him, I doubt that any of us will probably go through something that Job went through. It's unlikely. It's very unlikely. That's why we have such an extreme example for us in the Bible of such a godly man going through such an extreme hardship and hard trials. I mean, I think about the problems that we have in our life. Try to measure that up against what Job went against or what Jesus Christ went against for that matter. It's very, very unlikely that we'll, we'll get anywhere close to the level of, of persecution and problems that they went through. And I'm not trying to make light necessarily of what, of what problems you have because we all have uh, our own issues and, and things that we have to deal with. But put it in perspective. And when you do that, that should hopefully embolden you or, or give you comfort and, and build you up a little bit to know that, hey, these, these people went through this stuff and, and that was probably a lot harder than what I'm going through right now. God could get me through this. He was able to get Job through his problems. And, um, but look at 2 Samuel chapter 22 because um, I need to get there myself. This is an excellent, what this is, this is a psalm of David that's recorded in 2 Samuel. Um, David is, is kind of praising God. And ba basically what this is, this is a summary 
of God's power in a godly man's life. The power that you can get from God. And this kind of answers all of the attacks that, that Satan can have against us, we find in this chapter. So we're going to read through this chapter. Um, 2 Samuel chapter 22, verse number 1 says, And David spake unto the Lord the words of this song in the day that the Lord had delivered him out of the hand of all his en enemies and out of the hand of Saul. And he said, The Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer. The God of my rock, in him will I trust. He is my shield and the horn of my salvation, my high tower and my refuge, my savior. Thou savest me from violence. So he's, he's, he's praising God and saying, God's my rock. God's my defense. God's who I'm putting my trust in. When I'm getting attacked, whether it be by Satan, whether it be by men, wherever the attack's coming from, God's my defense. I'm trusting in God. I'm trusting in the power of God. Verse number four says, I will call on the Lord who is worthy to be praised. So shall I be saved from mine enemies. He said, I'm just going to call on God. When I'm being attacked, I'm going to just cry out to God. I'm going to cry out to my Father. Again, I love, I'm, I love the fact that we're the children of God. Because if I were to think of one of my daughters going, you know, Daddy, Daddy, help me. Someone's coming out to get me. Do you just take a guess what my reaction is going to be to that? <laughs> I'm going to be there in a, in a heartbeat. The thing about if you're as a child of God and you're crying out to God for help because someone's after you, someone's out to get you, don't you think that he would do the same thing? We can have that confidence and know that. And as we grow older, obviously they're, they're real young and they need to be protected. As they get older, you know, sometimes they might get themselves into situations where I'm not going to necessarily be able to, to protect them. And they get themselves in those situations. And um, I believe it's the same thing with God. And we're going to get into this a little bit too. How, you know, we don't, we can fully trust in God. But we want to make sure that we are keeping ourselves as good children also. To, to get the, the extra attention and the extra help that we need from God. But we're going we're gonna to see that in Scripture. I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself. So let's see verse number 5. Um, as we saw in verse 4, he saved, he saved David from all his enemies. Verse 5, when the waves of death compassed me, the floods of ungodly men made me afraid. The sorrows of hell compassed me about. The snares of death prevented me. In my distress, I called upon the Lord and cried to my God. And he did hear my voice out of his temple. And my cry did enter in his ears. He said, in my worst times, everyone's after me. I cried unto God and he heard me. Verse number eight. Then the earth shook and trembled. The foundations of heaven moved and shook because he was wrong. This is the power of God. Satan's got a little bit of power. He's got a little bit of destructive power. But when God gets angry, the whole earth moves. When God gets angry, to the foundations of heaven moved and shook. This is the power that God has, and this is the power that we can trust in. Verse number 9, There went up a smoke out of his nostrils, and fire out of his mouth devoured. Coals were kindled by it. He bowed the heavens also, and came down, and darkness was under his feet. And he rode upon a cherub, and did fly, and he was seen upon the wings of the wind. And he made darkness pavilions round about him, dark waters and thick clouds of the skies. Through the brightness before him were coals of fire kindled. The Lord thundered from heaven, and the Most High uttered his voice, and he sent out arrows and scattered them, lightning and discomfited them. And the channels of the sea appeared. The foundations of the world were discovered at the rebuking of the Lord, at the blast of the breath of his nostrils. He sent from above, he took me, he drew me out of many waters, he delivered me from my strong enemy and from them that hated me, for they were too strong for me. I wasn't able to to defeat my enemies. They were way too strong for me. But God thundered and came down from heaven and, and saved me and protected me. 
Verse 19, they prevented me in the day of my calamity, but the Lord was my stay. He brought me forth also into a large place. He delivered me, look at this, because he delighted in me. The Lord rewarded me according to my righteousness. According to the cleanness of my hands hath he recompensed me. For I have kept the ways of the Lord and have not wickedly departed from my God. For all his judgments were before me. And as for his statutes, I did not depart from them. I was also upright before him and have kept myself from mine iniquity. You see, sometimes when, when, you know, when we get caught up into sin, when we start doing bad things, what we receive is a recompense for our sins. We're being punished as a result for the things that we're doing wrong. So when you're getting attacked and, and you're in sin, that might be part of the reason why you're getting attacked. And God's not going to save you out of that because he says, no, you need, you need to go through this. Because you're doing wrong, because, because you're not following and listening to me. You need to be disciplined in this way. But when we're doing everything right, when we're saying, look, God, I'm, 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 I'm following your words. I'm, you know, I'm, I'm not in. He's going to say, I haven't turned my heart from you. I'm, I'm following you, dear Lord. He's going to see that. And yeah, we're going to protect you, of course. But we need to make sure, just, I mean, introspect. Look at yourself when, when you go through the hard times and think, you know, always call on God. Always. That's... <laughs> Never do not call on God. Always go to Him. But also just look inside, look at yourself, say, am I in sin? Am I, am I doing something to bring this on myself? You know, um, what can I be doing to, to just be as right as I can be with God? Always do that and always go to God. And we can trust in Him and, and you know, do the things that we need to do. But God is completely capable and powerful enough to deliver us out of any problems. Or you think of one of my favorite stories about was a Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Remember, they got thrown into the burning, fiery furnace because they wouldn't bow down to the word to the image of Baal. They wouldn't bow down. They wouldn't do it. He says, look, you either bow down or you're going to be put to death. You're going to be burned alive. And I don't know about you, but I don't want to get burned alive. That is not a pleasant death to have at all. I mean, that's, that's like, I mean, shoot me, right? <laughs> But don't burn me to death. That's, that's, that's torture. But they said, you know what? How, how easy would it have been for them to just get on their knees? That's an easy act to do. Bend those knee muscles and just get down. They could have saved their skin. They said, nope, not going to do it. Why? We're being attacked. We didn't do anything wrong. God's more powerful than you are. God is able to deliver us, even from your hands, even from that burning, fiery furnace. We know that God told us not to do this, and we're not going to do it. God is a power, and you know what? God did it. They were walking around as if it's no big deal. They walked around right in the middle of this, this hot, the fire was so hot that the people that threw them in died because the fire was so hot. And they got tossed in to the middle of this thing. They're walking around. They're walking around with Jesus. They cast three people in there, there was four. He says the, the, the form of the fourth is like the Son of God. No. God has power to protect. Let's finish up this chapter. Verse 26 says, uh, verse 25. Therefore the Lord hath recompensed me according to my righteousness, according to my cleanness in his eyesight. With the merciful thou wilt show thyself merciful, and with the upright man thou wilt show thyself upright. With the pure, thou wilt show thyself pure, and with the froward, thou wilt show thyself unsavory. And the afflicted people, thou wilt save, but thine eyes are upon the haughty, that thou mayest bring them down. So he's giving a warning. I mean, God sees the proud person too, that haughty person. You're going to be brought low. And when people attack you, you can't necessarily expect to be delivered from that if, you, if you're a, a prideful person, an arrogant person. You might just need to be brought down. But verse number 29 says, For thou art my lamp, O Lord, and the Lord will lighten my darkness. For by thee I have run through a troop. By my God have I leaped over a wall. And these, now these are, look at the strength now that David is attributing to God. 
the power that he's attributing that he received from God. Not just for his defense and his salvation. Now it's to do more and, 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 to, and to actually do things by the power of God. He says, for by thee, in verse 30, I have run through a troop. By my God have I leaped over a wall. He's saying, God strengthened me. I'm able now to, you know, I can leap over his wall. He says in verse number 31, as for God, his way is perfect. The word of the Lord is tried. He is a buckler all in the trust in him. Verse 32, for who is God save the Lord, and who is a rock save our God? God is my strength and power, and he maketh my way perfect. He maketh my feet like hinds feet, and setteth me upon my high places. He teacheth my hands to war, so that a bow of steel is broken by mine arms. Thou hast also given me the shield of thy salvation, and thy gentleness hath made me great. Thou hast enlarged my steps under me so that my feet did not slip. He said, God strengthened me. He's taught me how to fight. He's taught me how to battle. And David was a great warrior. I mean, think about his battle with Goliath. He trusted and relied in God, but, you know, he slung that stone and was able to kill that giant with just, with just one rock to the head. And, um, and obviously that came from God. God gave him that power to do that. But a lot of you know, God's miracles and, and God's help isn't going to come if we're not doing things, if we are not being active as well. I mean, if David, if David just never would have said anything, and just would have got, maybe been afraid and, and, and didn't speak up about Goliath, the miracle never, never would have happened. Who knows what would have happened? Then? It took David to take the initiative to say, hey, I'm going to stand up for God. This guy is defying God. This guy is defying the armies of Israel. We're not going to stand for this. God's more powerful than that. I trust in God. He's going to deliver me. He's going to deliver this uncircumcised Philistine into my hands. He's going to give me, you know, give me the victory because he's powerful to do that, but it took David to do that. And it takes you to take that initial step and, and, to, and to be able to trust in God enough to walk out in faith. And, and to not have fear, and to not let fear, especially the fear of the power of Satan, rule your life, and be worried about the things that he might do unto you. People say, oh, I don't want to go out and, and talk about Jesus to anyone because they might yell at me. They might, they might look at me badly. They might, you know, I don't know what they'll do. And it's fear. We can't live by that fear. We need to trust in God. We need, we need to just say, hey, God told me to do it, so I'm going to do it. And whatever it may be in your life, I mean, there's all kinds of things. There's, you know, the, the, the sodomites have been coming against faithful word. They'll probably end up coming against our church at some point. We can't be afraid of that. You know, and, and the, more, the more work you're doing for God, the more you're going to be getting attacked. And all the more reason you've got to be trusting in the power of God. And just keep doing what's right. And if you keep doing what's right, hey... I'm going to rely on God to protect me and for God to save me. Um, let's finish off this chapter real quick and we'll be done. Verse number 38, I have pursued mine enemies and destroyed them and turned not again until I have consumed them. And I have consumed them and wounded them that they could not arise. Yea, they are fallen under my feet. For thou hast girded me with strength to the battle. Them that rose up against me hast thou subdued under me. Thou hast also given me the necks of mine enemies, that I might destroy them that hate me. They looked, but there was none to save, even unto the Lord. But he answered them not. He's talking about his enemies. So he's saying when his enemies finally looked unto God, God said, uh-oh, I'm not going to help you out. You're, you're attacking you know, my servant. You're attacking David. But um, he says in verse 43, Then did I beat them as small as the dust of the earth. I did stamp them as the mire of the street, and did spread them abroad. Thou also hast delivered me from the strivings of my people. Thou hast kept me to be head of the heathen. A people which I knew not shall serve me. Strangers shall submit themselves unto me. As soon as they hear, they shall be obedient unto me. And this is some of the blessings now we see in, this, in the last part of this chapter of being obedient and trusting in God's power. And trusting in God's might, we see the blessings then coming down after he's been tried and, and gone through all the hardship that he's gone through. He comes through, he comes out just fine and God blesses him. Verse 46, strangers shall fade away and they shall be afraid out of their close places. The Lord liveth and 
Blessed be my rock, and exalted be the God of the rock of my salvation. It is God that avengeth me, and that bringeth down the people under me, and that bringeth me forth from mine enemies. Thou also hast lifted me up on high above them that rose up against me. Thou hast delivered me from the violent man. Therefore I will give thanks unto thee, O Lord, among the heathen, and I will sing praises unto thy name. He is the tower of salvation for his king, and showeth mercy to his anointed unto David and to his seed forevermore. Abigail, stop that. Satan's got a lot of power. He does. And we've seen that. And it's evident. And, and, and he has different tactics and different ways of attacking us, trying to gain our confidence, trying to deceive us, trying to, to sucker us into sinning, trying to make put up this big illusion of how great sin is and how great it's going to be and how attractive it is. And it's, it's just a, one big fat lie to get you to sin against God and do this wrong. It's not going to bring fulfillment in your life. It's not going to make you happy. It's going to make you more miserable than anything. When, when you actually, if, you, if you actually get caught up into any of the sins or lies of the devil, we need to do as James 4 says in verse 7, Submit yourselves therefore to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw nigh to God, and he will draw nigh to you. Cleanse your hands, ye sinners, and purify your hearts, ye double-minded. If we draw nigh to God, God's going to get close to us. And I don't know about you, but when I'm going through troubles, I want God as close as possible. I don't want him real far away from me. I don't want to be real far away from him. I want him right next to me. I don't want my little girls confronted with some big danger problem when I'm down in Phoenix at work. I want to be right there next to them to, to help them immediately. I don't want them to have to wait. And if you, you know, think about that in terms of your own spiritual walk with God, because see, God doesn't have to go away to work somewhere and, and, and leave you back the way that I have to do with my children. But it's up to us to, to, to try to get closer to Him. And, and as we do, hey, we take a step towards God, He'll take a step towards us. And He cut that distance, however far away we may be from Him today, we cut that distance in half. I mean, you walk twice as fast to Him because He steps towards you when you step towards Him. So that, that distance gets, gets shorter and shorter from both ends a lot faster as long as we keep moving in that direction. And... Um, you know, don't be ignorant to the power that Satan has. Don't charge God foolishly and think, why is this happening to me, God, as if God's the one that's responsible? Because I, I guarantee you, it's not going to be God that's just making you, you know, like that, that's attacking you. God doesn't attack you. You may have to be disciplined from time to time, and God may allow things to happen from time to time, but God doesn't attack you as his child. It's not going to happen. Keep the right perspective. Know who the devil is so that you can resist him. So you be aware of his devices and not be ignorant of his devices so that we can just be strong and he'll run away from us. Let's bow our heads and pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for your words and for your strength and for your power, dear God. And, and the, the awesome power that you possess, dear Lord, is just is unrivaled, unmatched, or it's a joke to even think that Satan has anywhere near the power that you have. You're the one that grants power, dear Lord. We have nothing to fear of the devil. We just need to, to keep our fear in the right place and fear you, the one who truly wields the power, dear Lord, and um, that we, we definitely love you and we want to serve you and be closer to you, dear God. Watch out for us. God, protect us. Protect us from these evil attacks um, as, as we try to walk in, in the will of the Lord. God, help us to, to be free from these attacks and be, remain strong through them, dear Lord, and remain founded and grounded in our faith and um, not to blame you for, for these attacks that Satan has against us, dear Lord. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.